All right, gang, now I wanna take a look at uh, the method of substitution it's called, okay? So in our previous lecture, we were looking at indefinite integrals and we were solving them, especially when the integrand was the result of a chain rule, okay? And then we, we revisited the special case of the chain rule and so on. Um, but here, notice gang, the integrand here, notice that one part is not the derivative of another part, okay? So this integrand here, it is, it is entirely appropriate to think of it as f prime, of course. It is not, however, the result of taking the chain rule, right? You can, you can verify that, right? Not one part is the derivative of another part. Well, it turns out there's a clever method to solve such problems, okay? And it's called the method of substitution. This is how it works, okay? I'm going to do this. I'm going to let the letter u represent one part of the integrand here. And I'm going to say let u equal x minus 2. Okay? So what's going to happen, gang, is that letter u is going to take the place of the denominator here. Okay? So here's what I've got so far. Okay? Now, you can't go mixing letters like this, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to transform the entire integral over to one that contains just the letter u in it, okay? Which means now I've got it. Now that I've, I've, I've replaced the denominator, I need to replace the numerator x and the differential of x right here, okay? So I go back over to this right here where I, I said let u equal x minus 2, okay? Then I notice that if I take the differential of both sides of this equation, remember differentials now. Well, the differential of u is one du, and the differential of x minus two is one dx. Okay, so this will allow me to replace the dx symbol right here. So now I've got this so far. Okay, du and the dx are the same thing. Then, from the first equation, u equals x minus 2. Gang, I can solve this equation for the letter x. Add 2 to the left-hand side. Okay, now I'm going to use that x to replace my numerator, bam, right there. So my transformed integral becomes as follows. Okay? Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split up the numerators and rewrite that expression to get 1 plus 2 divided by u. So what was the point of it all? Okay, why did I bother going through all this extra work? Well, the x divided by x minus 2, gang, from our experiences, right, from our experiences, we can't find an antiderivative for that by itself. Right, you go back and search your experiences. The derivative of what function gives me x divided by x minus 2? Can you think of that right away? Yeah, neither can I. But if we, and it's not a chain rule either. But if we try this method of substitution, look what we get. We can now find with this transformed integral, we can read off the antiderivatives of both of those terms, sum and difference rule. Okay? Right? The antiderivative of 1 du is just u plus the derivative of, or antiderivative, excuse, excuse me, 2 over u is 2 natural logarithm of u. Okay, so we took something that we couldn't evaluate at all, and we turned it or transformed it into something that became something that was routine. Now, of course, we started the problem in x's, so you've got to go back. Replace the letter u with the function it represents. Remember, u is equal to x minus 2, so go put that back. Okay, it's called the method of sub. Isn't that clever, gang? The method of substitution. Okay, the method of substitution. All right, here's another example. Now, you probably recognize right away from our previous presentation, right? That's our thing. That's the special case of the chain rule. That's our thing, right? The outside is exactly the derivative of the inside function, which is raised to a power, 
okay? That's a special case of the chain rule. We're missing a number here. What number are we missing in front? Yes, we're missing an 11. So we would multiply by a 111, one over 11 rather, out front, okay? But let's suppose that we weren't, you know, we weren't looking for that particular chain rule, okay? And we want to use the method of substitution for this, okay? So what I'm going to do here, gang, it's customary, right? Not customary, it's a good rule of thumb, not written in stone. But when you're doing a substitution problem like this, okay, it's, it's a good idea to try to let u equal the inside part of the function. In this case, the inside would be the sine function, okay? That's not a hard and fast rule. It's just a rule of thumb, okay? So I'm going to let u equal the sine of x. So then my integral looks like this. Okay, back here. So that means now the cosine of x and the dx both have to go, right? We're transforming the whole integral over to u's now. I will come back here. If I take the differential of both sides of this equation, then one du is equal to the cosine of x dx. And all of that is right here, which means all of it can be replaced with the differential of u. And so that's gonna give me this then. Okay, and that's just a simple power rule for antiderivatives, gang. And then, of course, replace the letter u with the function it represents, which in this case is equal to the sine. All right, and, and as always, you can take the derivative of your answers as a check. Okay, was it necessary to use the substitution method on this? No, it took more time than it than was necessary. We could have gone right to the answer by making the adjustment multiplied by an 11 on the inside and one over 11 on the outside, like we were doing in the previous presentation, okay? What happens if it's a definite integral? Okay, suppose we have the definite integral, right? Oop. It went out of focus. Let me copy the problem down, gang, and maybe it'll come back. There it goes. Okay, so now it's a definite integral, right? So what does this represent? Well, if we think of the integrand as velocity, right, then what we're, what we're looking for here is displacement, right? Because it's a definite integral, all right? But what I'm, and, and notice that the outside is exactly the derivative of the inside. Well, actually, we're off by a minus. So that's our, that's our thing, gang. We, we don't need the substitution method to do this. But yeah, you know, we'll play the game. We'll play the game. All right, so let's do this. Let's let u equal the inside part of the function, which would be the cosine. All right, so that's going to replace this problem. So put a circle around it. That's going to replace this, OK? What else has to be replaced? Well, the sine of theta, the differential of theta, and two more things, gang, these limits of integration. See, everything in this problem depends on what theta is, but we're gonna transform everything over to the letter U, okay? So here's what we've got so far. Okay, all right, now back over to here. If I take the differential of both sides of this, one du is equal to minus the sine of theta, d theta. Well, I've got the sine of theta, d theta right here. I just don't have that negative one out in front, okay? All right, I'll fix that. Let's multiply by a negative one right here and multiply by a negative one out in front to compensate, okay? So now I can replace all of this with a du. Now here's what we've got so far. Okay, now the last thing that has to go are the limits of integration. Okay, we've got to remember these are theta, this is theta equals zero to theta equals pi over four. So those have to be transformed as well. Okay, and so how would I do that? Well, here, it, it rests, gang, it rests on this right here. Okay, like this. For theta is equal to zero, which is the lower limit of integration right here, u is equal to the cosine of zero, which is equal to one. 
and for theta is equal to the upper limit, which is pi over four, u is equal to the cosine of pi over four, which is root two over two. So my entire transformed integral now is gonna look like this. Okay, and that's just a simple power rule, of in, uh, a power rule for integrals, right? So I'm gonna get negative u to the negative two divided by negative two, evaluated from u equals one to u equals root two over two, right? That's our fundamental theorem, okay? Our fundamental theorem recovery method is what we were calling it, okay? All right, so put the, actually, you know what? Let's clean this up a little bit. Minus over minus positive, right? Let's, let's clean this up. to get our final result, okay? And that's up to you if you wanna simplify that. It's a calculator problem is really what it amounts to, okay? All right, so, gang, so before we go any further, I wanna remind you of a couple of things, okay? I, sh I probably should have said recall, right? <laughs> all right, first of all, special case of the chain rule. Okay, special case of the chain rule. And I'm gonna put it in differential form, okay? So the differential of a function raised to a real number power what made it so special was the frequency with which these things, right, they occur in practice. All right, so that's a differential form, okay? Second thing I want you to remember is the power rule for antiderivatives. Okay, remember the power rule for antiderivatives? It looked like this. When x was raised to a real number power, then this was equal to x to the n plus one over n plus one plus c, as long as n was not equal to negative one, because if it was, then the antiderivative was the logarithm of x plus c. Okay, all right, so the reason I point these out, gang, consider the following. Okay, I want to evaluate one time for all time, all integrals of the form, some function raised to a power, and the outside is the derivative of that inside function. Okay, so in other words, I wanna, so it, think of it, it's, it's this right here. It's a version of this right here. You're off by a number out in the front, but I wanna find all antiderivatives one time for all time. Okay, for any integrand, that's the special case of the chain rule, okay? All right, so I'm gonna use the method of substitution to do it. After all, that's what we're talking about, right? So I'm gonna let u replace the function f of x. Then I'm gonna take the differential of both sides of this equation to get one du is equal to f prime of x dx. And so my integral now becomes this, right? Okay, and that's just the power rule for integrals right here in remark number two. And so that's equal to to this. Okay, of course we know though it's gang, right? When you do the method of substitution in the end, you have to replace the letter U with the function that it represents. So this integral, whose integrand is, a, is the special case of the chain rule, by our work above and the substitution method is equal to the following one time for all time. Okay, 
Now, when I say one time for all time game, what that means for us is that anytime we see an, uh, an indefinite integral or definite integral, right, whose integrand is the special case of the chain rule, we don't have to go through the method of substitution over and over and over again every time we encounter it. We just did them all for the rest of our lives. The answers are right there, <laughs> okay? We just showed them all. Now, is that all chain rules? No, we're only talking about the special case of the chain rule, right? And why do we single it out? Because the, the frequency of which they occur in practice, all right? Examples. Okay, look at that. Okay, the outside 4x to the third is exactly the derivative of the inside function raised to a real number power. Gang, that's the special case of the chain rule. And based on what we just found with the substitution rule, one time for all time, I can go right to the answer. X to the fourth plus one, add one to the three halves to get five halves, divided by five halves plus C. Done, okay? It is not necessary to go through the whole, let U equal X to the fourth plus one, DU equals this, ah, not for these, okay? We just proved them all forever, one time for all time, example. We have a definite integral from zero to two. Okay. Let's make this to the second. Oh, there's a lot of twos in there, isn't there? <laughs> anyway, this can be rewritten like this. It's a little bit in disguise, but look at this gang. X squared plus one to the negative two power. Okay, well, that's our thing. The outside is exactly the derivative of the inside raised to a real number power. That's the special case. That's, that's our thing. And so we can go right to it. Okay. Of course, we can clean that up a little bit, right? So the two is going to go in first. Minus the zero goes in next. To get four fifths. Okay. Example. Okay, so here we have the logarithm of X divided by X. Okay. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I'm, oh, I'm going to definitely need substitution method on this. But hold on. Notice if I just rearrange the factors, you can, you'd be surprised how much insight you can gain just by moving factors over <laughs> like that. Okay. Why do I do this? The X in the denominator, I move it over as 1 over X because I recognize that 1 over X is exactly the derivative of the logarithm of X, which happens to be raised to the first power. That's our thing. Okay, that's our thing. And what we showed, again, don't forget, gang, don't lose sight of this now, right? We proved one time for all time using the method of substitution that to find the indefinite integral of that special case of the chain rule, all we have to do is go right to our answers now. They're right here, okay? Add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. If, however, the integer or the exponent n is equal to negative one, then it's going to be a logarithm. Okay, it's going to be a logarithm. Okay. So I'm going to add one to the exponent, divide by it, and evaluate it from one to e squared. Okay, and that's going to equal two. You can verify that. All right, you can verify that. All right, now let me make a remark here. All right, let me make a remark. We said that the derivative of the logarithm of a function, when it's a composition now, is equal to the reciprocal of that function times the derivative of that function. Okay, it's been a while, but we talked about this which I can rewrite 
like this. Okay. So when I say in this expression, f of x to the n times f prime of x. is equal to a logarithm if n is equal to negative one, okay? You know, you may be wondering, well, why is that as a reminder? Well, we'll put a negative one right there, okay? If n is equal to negative one, then we're gonna have, we're gonna have this, right? Okay, and that integrand right there, gang, that is exactly this expression with a different letter of the alphabet. Instead of G, we're using the letter F. And that's why if you backtrack all the way back to the beginning, that's why we say this must be equal to the logarithm of F of X. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody understands, you know, where we're, where we're coming from with that. Okay. Okay, now this, that is not the special case of the chain rule, okay, because we don't have a function raised to a real number power here, and the outside is the derivative of the inside, okay. It is going to be the result of a chain rule, though. We don't need u substitution for this. In fact, I think we can figure this out on our own, okay. From your experiences, gang, what function do, at, at, at the least, at the very least, what function do I have to write here? so that when I take its derivative, will take me right back to the cosine. Yeah, the sine, right? The sine function, right? At a minimum, we've got to start with this. Okay, and then we'll add the vertical shift. But at a minimum, we've got to start with this, okay? Are we close? Let's check. If I take the derivative of the sine of 2x plus 5, okay, I do a little check down here. Okay, by the chain rule, that's going to give me the cosine of 2x plus 5, which I do have, bam! But by the chain rule, the derivative of 2x plus 5 is equal to 2. And so I would have this. I do not have a factor of 2 here. And so therefore, I'll just compensate then by multiplying my result by a 1 half. So that when I check it now, the 1 half is there already. And it will cancel with the 2 on the outside here. Okay, so again, the reason I point this out to you and the reason I did not do that, ex that last example there with the method of substitution is because look, the method of substitution is good. It's not all powerful, okay? But the method of substitution is certainly good. But is it always necessary? No, you'd be surprised how many integrals you can solve on your own by your own experiences, okay? You know, a lot, you, a lot of people, they, they get a brand new tool, right? They get a hammer. The problem is if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail, <laughs> right? The old saying. So just be mindful of that. Just because the problems in the book say to use the substitution method doesn't mean you have to, all right? Be on the lookout for that and trust your experiences, okay? Not every single problem has to be done by the method of substitution, all right? 